Well, good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's presentation, Woodpeckers 101. My name is James Stevenson, and I'm coming to you from the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, the extension of the University of Florida right here in Pinellas County, uh, Brooker Creek Preserve to be exact. If you haven't visited Brooker Creek Preserve, please do come and hike our trails. We're open every day, except the day after Thanksgiving and Christmas day. We have about four miles of trails to explore and an environmental education center, including an exhibit hall, open Thursdays through Sundays, uh, nine to four Thursday through Saturday and 11 to four on Sunday. Bring the family, it's a really good day out. Today's presentation, Woodpeckers 101. Did you know that we have different kinds of woodpeckers? Did you know different kinds of woodpeckers even existed? Have you ever even considered the woodpecker? These questions and more are kind of what inspired today's presentation. And we hope that you'll come away with a few interesting facts, a little bit more appreciation, and we will help you understand ways that you can help this interesting subset of birds that we have here in our own backyard. What we'll look at today is the kind of idea of woodpeckers, uh, where they exist worldwide, um, how they get along in life, and we'll take apart, not literally, but we'll have a look at individual species that are easily observed outdoors, even in our urban areas, where several of these species have become quite adapted, and some that you'll have to visit our natural areas, like our parks and our preserves, uh, to visit, to see in the wild. So if that sounds reasonable, if that's what you signed up for, let's go ahead and get started. But first, a disclaimer uh, to those of you who haven't joined before, um, you might not realize that my background is botany. So technically I'm a botanist. And when you start talking about birds to a botanist, this kind of image is what a botanist might, uh, this might be how a botanist would view birds. Like there's the bird and then there's the plant that the bird is sitting on. Having said that, I have an innate personal interest in ornithology and in birds uh, because of the immense pleasure that can be had observing them in the wild. So I promise you I'm not making anything up today. Woodpeckers are a group of birds. Of course, birds are a very large and varied group of animals that all share characteristics that make them birds, right? Two legs, wings, elongated face, fashioned into a beak. Uh, they are actually living dinosaurs. They are avian dinosaurs. Uh, and within the this large group of animals that are known as the birds that all share a common ancestor and have diversified into the many myriad of types of birds we have today. We have everything from hummingbirds to the ostrich. So lots of diversity within this group. One small group within there is this one we're focusing on today, the woodpeckers. And they are actually found worldwide. And this map represents the distribution of the woodpeckers and of all the different kinds of woodpeckers, which we'll look at in just a minute. But across the world, you can see where woodpeckers are generally distributed. They seem to like tropical forests. Uh, the species richness, that means the greatest number of species in the greatest numbers, are found in tropical forests, both in Asia, down here in Southeast Asia, and in South America. So these are the areas of the, of the densest and most diverse of the woodpeckers, but they can be found pretty much anywhere where there is forest, any kind of forest. So their diversity is greatest in tropical forests, but here in the temperate North America, you can see that we have a pretty rich diversity there and all across Europe, Asia, Russia, all through there, and even through the central parts of Africa. Note that woodpeckers are missing 
from Australia. Australia broke away and took its own raft of wildlife with it, uh, perhaps before the common ancestor that gave rise to the different woodpeckers uh, had come onto the scene. You'll also note that woodpeckers aren't a big fan of deserts because they love forests so much. And, you know, deserts lack in most everything, uh, trees notwithstanding. So they're absent from these very arid places, uh, the Sahara and the Arabian Desert, although they are found in the desert southwest because, as we'll see in a bit, um, there are trees in the desert southwest, even though they might challenge your idea of exactly what a tree looks like. So woodpeckers like are, are associated with forests and woodpeckers fill a very important ecological role where they live, in the forests where they live. They uh, convey engineering activity. It's a fancy, uh, ecology word for they can do something, they can build something, they can create something, they can engineer. And woodpeckers have the ability to burst through the protective outer covering the bark of trees. Being engineers and being able to modify the habitat that they live in, woodpeckers are often found to be keystone species in the habitats where they live. That means that their presence and their activities bring a benefit to other species and success for other species within the same habitat. Other way of putting that, if the woodpeckers weren't there, all these other species wouldn't be there either. So keystone species, uh, their presence and the health of their populations uh, has a knock-on effect to the health of the overall system and overall uh, the organisms that exist within that ecosystem. Here's an example. This is the black woodpecker, a European species, but you can see the familial characteristics. You would probably recognize the adult bird on the right as a woodpecker. Woodpeckers have the ability to create cavities in trees. So here we have, you see where this black woodpecker, uh, this is actually the male, has excavated a cavity into this living tree trunk uh, in order to uh, provide a, a nest area for the mated pair to raise their young. And that engineering activity is not limited to the woodpecker. Once the woodpecker has, the pair of woodpeckers have successfully raised their young, that cavity is then available to a host of other different species. It might be other species of birds that are also cavity nesters, but that cannot create that cavity on their own. Or it might be other organisms that require or benefit from the presence of a cavity in a tree. Think about squirrels would want to move into a cavity in a tree. Uh, bees uh, would love nothing more than to set up a nice colony uh, protected from the elements and from predators uh, in the cavity of a tree. And spare a thought even for the fungus. Uh, by creating a, an opening in the trunk of a tree, fungus is able to move into that tree for better, for worse, for the tree. So here we have an example of another species moving in to the cavity created by a woodpecker. This is one of our uh, Southeast US, one of our Pinellas species. This is a little screech owl. And screech owls cannot make their own cavities in trees. They just don't have the equipment. They don't have the hardware. But they do depend on the efforts of other uh, cavity creating forces uh, to make their nest. So here's a little adult screech owl um, in a cavity created by something else. And as I mentioned before, other organisms, even fungus, the woodpeckers are have been shown to be very effective of getting fungus from one tree to the other. And again, 
it might be good for the tree, it might be bad for the tree, but it overall helps the ecosystem because fungus, of course, has its place in any ecosystem, uh, serving its function, going through its life cycle, uh, contributing and withdrawing uh, resources from that um, ecosystem. So let's look at some examples of this diverse group of birds that includes uh, birds that live in the jungle. So we saw the map earlier and the greatest diversity of species and the greatest density are found in the jungles of South America. Here's an example of a South American woodpecker. This is the yellow-throated woodpecker. And again, even though it's not black and white, which is a color, a color scheme that we often associate with woodpeckers, you would probably see this bird and think, it looks like a woodpecker. Uh, it has that blunt chisel shaped, not blunt, uh, short and stout chisel shaped beak. Uh, two forward and two rear facing toenails on two fore and rear facing toes. Um, the checkerboard pattern, in this case on the breast of this bird, and hints of red about the head. So that's a yellow throated. The Gila woodpecker is one from our desert southwest. And as I mentioned, the woodpeckers don't like deserts with no trees, but our deserts, some of our deserts in the southeast US, they do have trees. They just happen to be large cacti. And the woodpeckers have adapted to that, and they quite happily create their cavities in cactus, living or and or dead cactus. So again, you see the familial characteristics. Again, that kind of checkerboard pattern, in this case, black and white across the back. And if you can just see a little hint of red on the crown of the Gila woodpecker, um, belying its relation to the rest of the group. The pileated woodpecker, this is one that's found in the Southeast US very adaptable to human habitation. So here, this pileated woodpecker, this pair of pileated woodpecker peckers have created a cavity in a telephone pole. So these birds have shown adaptation to human activities and human structures. So humans moving into their uh, territory, moving into their landscape, into their habitat, um, hasn't had a negative effect on this particular species. They've adapt, they are adaptable and they have certainly made use, made best use of human made materials. The red-bellied woodpecker, this is probably our most common in Pinellas. This is the one that you're going to see both in natural areas like our parks and preserves, and also uh, amongst the trees in suburban situations, uh, in your neighborhoods, um, anywhere that large trees have become established or have been planted, you will find the red-bellied woodpecker. This one's often referred to as red-headed, um, not surprisingly, because it has a very large swath of red on its head, but in fact, the species is the red bellied woodpecker. Um, we'll see why when we go over a few of the um, few of the species in a bit. As far as a group, the woodpeckers, it seems like everyone wants to know what the biggest is. What's the oldest? What's the biggest? What's the meanest? Which is the most bloodthirsty? You know, all these extremes. Well, I can tell you that the largest is probably extinct, although there are here and there, sightings, uh, recordings, this sort of thing, uh, the imperial woodpecker. And this one between 22, uh, 23 and a bit inches tall, uh, if this woodpecker were standing next to you right now, if you're sitting in a chair at a desk, uh, this little woodpecker could probably put its chin on your lap and you could pet its little head or big head. Um, that's about the size of the imperial woodpecker. And again, you can see the characteristics that are common across the family. Black and white coloration, uh, hints of red about the head, those two forward and two rear facing uh, toes with very significant claws for clinging onto tree branches. This one is found or was found uh, in Mexico.
definitely still around is the great slaty woodpecker from Southeast Asia. This is one of those from the jungles of Southeast Asia. We saw the diversity in South America. This is one from the jungles of Southeast Asia, the great slaty. And this one you can see having its woodpecker characteristics of that uh, very substantial chisel shaped bill. Uh, you probably can't see in this photograph the way that the toes are arranged, uh, but even in profile, you could probably recognize that this bird belongs to this group of birds known as the uh, woodpeckers. This one's about 19 to 23 inches. Uh, he would probably be just reaching your lap if he were standing next to you on the ground. So it's still a pretty substantial bird. The smallest, uh, about the size of a little wren. If you're familiar with wrens, little tiny brown bird, you can often see flitting around in the undergrowth. Uh, if you're not familiar with wren, perhaps you can picture a sparrow. Uh, if you're not familiar with sparrow, perhaps you could picture a parakeet. So around that size, a small bird. And there is actually a woodpecker that reaches that size. And it is in a, a subgroup still. So we have the birds, within the birds, we have the woodpeckers, and even within the woodpeckers, we have a few separate groups. Uh, one of those groups, the, what are known as the piculets, which means the little pikas, the little pecking birds, um, the piculets uh, found in Central and South America. So a cute little woodpecking bird, again, has the familial characteristics of the chisel-shaped beak and the two and two uh, um, toe organization. That chisel-like beak, the two and two that I keep referring to, here's a drawing right over my head with the two rear facing toes and two forward facing toes. That's referred to as zygodactyly zygodactyly. Um, the digits are bilaterally symmetrical, two in the front and two in the back. Another characteristic are uh, tail feathers that are very, very highly reinforced. They will often uh, have dark black pigments in those feathers. That black pigment is actually made of a protein that's very, very strong. So the, the pigment itself helps to reinforce those tail feathers. The mid vein, the rachis that runs down the center of each of the feathers, uh, each of the tail feathers is very, very dense, reinforced. Uh, the feathers themselves are very, very stiff because they are used to kind of hold the bird against the tree while they slam their head into it. Um, it braces them against the tree while they hammer away with their chisel-like bill. So these are adaptations that this group has um, evolved that allow for this particular lifestyle of running up and down trees using those forward and hind facing toes that allows them to cling and to move up and down and sideways along the trunk of a tree, which is more often than not held perpendicular to the ground, right? So we need to be modified to run up and down that perpendicular surface. The beak for excavating into both living and dead wood and the bracing tail feathers uh, that allow um, for some traction um, when slamming your face into a tree. Woodpeckers, they'll pretty much eat anything. They'll eat anything they can find, anything they can glean. Uh, they love insects. There are often plenty of insects to be found walking around on the trunks of trees. The insects themselves might be looking for a meal uh, either from the tree, the leaves, or the insects might be lo there looking for other insects to prey upon, and the woodpeckers in turn are looking for them. Uh, so they will eat insects, they will eat berries, they will eat fruits, they will eat seeds. Uh, they're really not fussy. Um, as mentioned before, 
their ability to create cavities uh, is due to their propensity to be cavity nesters. So not only will they excavate under the uh, bark of trees for food, but they will further that and create these cavities that they then nest in. Um, going forward, other species can then move into the cavities that they create. Uh, woodpeckers have a very distinctive flight pattern. And if you've ever seen a woodpecker take flight, you'll probably see them with powerful wing beats kind of fly forward and then kind of stop flapping and drop down a little bit and make a low arching swoop. And then right up to the same plane, flap a little bit more. And that kind of over and over swooping pattern might help you identify a woodpecker just in flight. Um, it's characteristic of the family. It's not unique to the family, but it is characteristic of the family. So how do they get along with all of this, you know, slamming their head into trees? That can't be good. Well, it didn't happen all at once. There wasn't a bird that suddenly decided that it had everything it needed to create a cavity in a living tree. Over time, modifications to the structure of this group of birds and the common ancestors of the birds that are around today, uh, over time, those adaptations arose and those adaptations uh, that worked out the best stuck around and became refined. Uh, one of the adaptations is the surface of the brain of this group of birds is smooth. Now, if you can, I'm sure you can picture a human brain in your brain. Just take a mental picture of a brain. You can see all the folds and wiggles and, you know, the kind of the surface texture of a brain. Well, all of those wrinkles and folds are not completely smooth, but they're smoothed over in the woodpecker brain, um, giving it a little bit of a smoother ride inside the skull. There's not that much cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. They don't have too much of that. So there's really not much liquid to be sloshing around inside the head, inside the spinal column. Uh, and the hyoid bone, which vertebrates have, we have one. It's uh, often referred to as the tongue bone. It's kind of up in here. It, in, in, in our neck, it kind of floats around. In woodpeckers, it's extraordinarily extended and it wraps over the head. Ours just kind of floats around in our neck. In woodpeckers, it extends all the way down to between their eyes and it serves two functions. It kind of holds the skull in place and it also gives a groove for the woodpecker's tongue to retract and coil up around the head of the bird on the inside. Because as we'll see later, um, when a woodpecker sticks its tongue out, it's a lot longer than its mouth. It has to have some place to hide. So those are a few of the adaptations that this group of birds have to cope with their lifestyle of creating uh, cavities in living and dead Tree. So why we've mentioned before, they're making a home. They're making a cavity where they can raise their young, protected from the elements and from predators, high off the ground um, with a good vantage point. You know, nothing's going to fly in unannounced, uh, not completely foolproof, but certainly safer than, say, nesting on the ground, right? Also, pecking, uh, lifting, uh, making holes flaking bark off the trunks of trees in search of food. So they peck to look for food and to create the holes. Sometimes, and right now would be one of those sometimes, uh, the males will find a particularly resonating surface, resonant surface, like a gutter or a downspout or a flat piece of aluminum or metal, uh, and they will just make 
an awful lot of noise. That repeated pecking on an impervious surface like a piece of metal, a downspout, for example, or gutters, for example, that's called drumming. That is communication. That's not looking for food. That's not excavating, you know, for a cavity. That's not a woodpecker getting it wrong. That's a woodpecker recognizing a material, recognizing a surface that when struck is going to make the greatest noise. And whomever makes the greatest noise that covers for the greatest distance is going to get the attention of the most potential mates. So it's a way of flirting. It's a way of announcing, I know what I'm doing. Look what I found. Not only did I find this really great piece of, of gutter, I can find you a really awesome tree. Come and check this out. They will also communicate to one another. This is where I'm setting up my territory. So any of you, you need to pick a different, cup, a different gutter, move on. Here we have that um, kind of the cross section through the head of a typical woodpecker. And you can see the hyoid bone that stretches up and over the skull where that creates the groove where the tongue can be retracted uh, when it's not being used to extract food from the crevices that it's either created or discovered along the surface of a tree. And you can see the tongue extended uh, in this drawing. You can see that this species, this contrived species uh, would be one that has barbs along the tongue that help it to grab um, prey species from within the crevices of a tree or the cavities that it's created. Uh, sometimes they're just plain sticky uh, where they can extract you know, termites uh, that may have moved into a, a, a tree branch or something like that. So sticky, barbed, or brushy, these are characteristics of many woodpecker species and they can be up to four inches long. So imagine if you could stick your tongue out three times the size of your face be quite a party trick. When it's time to get married, all the drumming is over, the cavity has been excavated, the eggs have been laid in that cavity. Most woodpecker species lay between four and six eggs. And once the, um, once the young have fledged, uh, it only takes a few weeks. Uh, they don't live in that cavity for very long, only as long as it takes to get the young out of the cavity. Uh, the parents will then each take their share. They split the brood. So if there were only two that survived to fledging, the mother would take one, the father would take one. You see how that works? If they had all four succeed, the mother would take two, the father would take two. That helps to keep resources from becoming too scarce. So once the kids are old enough, see you next year, I'm taking the kids and we're gonna go over there and see if we can find some food over there. So the whole family isn't trying to, you know, where it used to be just two birds looking for food, now it's six, you get what I'm saying? And the pairs are monogamous. They do stay together at least for the entire breeding season. So something to be said, um, for woodpecker morals, I don't know. They can live years and years and years. Um, these are not uh, a fast reproducing, highly reproducing, short lived species. These are not a species that, you know, we refer to them as nature's popcorn, where they just have dozens and dozens and dozens of young all year and nobody really gets very old. These are birds that aren't often prey species and they can get to be quite a few years old and live to raise a few young year after year. Uh, in captivity, of course, animals are always gonna live longer because they have uh, protection from predators, they have protection from disease, uh, they have, um, there are never any food shortages or there better not be. Uh, for birds in captivity, so they can certainly live much, much longer. Um, perhaps the oldest, I think the oldest recorded wild woodpecker um, 
verified was close to 30 years. Um, there are threats, however, um, to woodpeckers in the wild. Of course, it's, I say it a million times, it's not snow white out there. Everything needs to feed its young. Woodpeckers are, of course, prey species to things like hawks uh, that can come in and grab young or, or even adult birds. Um, there are snakes, of course. The Is it the rat snake that can climb? I'll, I might need to be corrected on that. Um, they can climb vertical surfaces, could certainly find that cavity nest and, and eat eggs or eat young birds. So certainly the threats are out there. Um, but generally speaking, they can live to be close to a, uh, a dozen years old. We saw earlier on, um, we were recognizing some species of woodpeckers from around the world, perhaps some that you had never seen before. And you could say, OK, I see how that's a woodpecker. Very often, the coloration is uniform across the, uh, across the, the group. The black and white with the red bits around the head, yellow is not an uncommon color as well. This photo was taken by our own Julia uh, in her yard where uh, a cavity was excavated. It may have been excavated by this flicker or it may have been excavated by another species, a pileated, uh, but it has become a place of contention. We'll go into that in just a second. Uh, but this picture of the Northern flicker shows that when in flight, this woodpecker species is showing that yellow can be quite a predominant color in woodpeckers. Uh, here, a good example of that bracing reinforced tail, these tail feathers being very extremely stiff, bracing reinforced, uh, the black pigment is actually very, very strong and reinforcing. So even though we have some decorative yellow along the shaft of the tail feathers, we still have that reinforcing black pigment right there at the tips. Woodpeckers are not songbirds. If you've ever heard a woodpecker make a noise, you would hopefully agree. Uh, the calls that they make um, hearken to the cartoon character, which we'll see in just a second. Um, so they do not sing. Remember the way that they attract mates and they advertise their territory during breeding season um, is through that drumming sound. So they make the, the crashing sounds against surfaces and the calls that accompany that are usually produced during breeding season as well. There is a little bit of communication that goes on between mated pairs. I'm here, I'm here, I found some food, I'll be right there. And also when the young have fledged, um, keeping track with each other through these calls, but there's no real song. The cartoon, um, the Woody Woodpecker, perhaps you've all heard of Woody Woodpecker. This slide shows the worldwide diversity of the different subgroups of this woodpecker subset of the birds. Does that make sense? So we've got all the birds, everything from the hummingbirds to the ostriches, or actually switch that from the ostriches all the way up to the sparrows. Uh, within all the birds, we have these subgroups. One of those subgroups are the woodpeckers. And then within the woodpeckers, we can refine that even more finely into these three main subfamilies. Um, we mentioned earlier on the smallest of the woodpeckers belong to the subfamily, the piculets, uh, the subfamily, the rhinex, that's nothing really to worry about. There's only two species, um, not very well represented, but they still get to belong to the family. The largest subfamily, of course, are the true woodpeckers, and that's who we're looking at today. And that subfamily is then subdivided into various tribes. And so you can see all these different tribes and the underlined names ref refer to particular genera. And what we have here in Pinellas County are in th uh, two different tribes. We have some from the tribe Pikini, uh, a couple of different genera there. 
and the Melanerpe tribe. We have a couple of, uh, we have three genera represented there. So basically just wanted to give you an overview of how worldwide the woodpeckers are organized into these subfamilies uh, and, and different tribes and what tribes are represented right here in Pinellas County. I can guarantee you though, none of them wear gloves like Woody does. That's not a characteristic of any living or extinct woodpecker. So in Pinellas, within this family, within this tribe, um, we have these two genera, the pileated woodpecker and the northern flicker. In the Melanerpe tribe, we have the sapsucker, the red-bellied woodpecker, and the downy woodpecker. I've got red-headed listed here, but I've struck through because red-headed woodpeckers are not found in Pinellas County. They don't recognize county borders or boundaries. And I'm not gonna say that a red-headed woodpecker has never flown into Pinellas County airspace. And I'm not gonna say that a red-headed woodpecker has never landed on a tree in Pinellas County, but they are not established within the county borders. The red-headed woodpeckers just aren't found here. We don't have the right habitat for them and they cannot engineer it for themselves. So this is what we have to look at and we'll go through these uh, one at a time. The red-headed wood, uh, sorry, the pileated woodpecker with its large size, very prominent crest of red feathers. These are very loud. These are very gregarious. Uh, these are very um, grand when they fly with their broad wings and that sweeping flight pattern. The flicker is probably our least woodpecker-like woodpecker. -like woodpecker. Uh, they are the ones that have, you know, more, um, they're more warmly colored in these browns and grays and that that wonderful yellow of the underwings and the area underneath the tail uh, with that uh, cockade of red on the back of the head. They have a wonderful uh, throat patch as well. The sap sucker. This is one who comes and visits us in the winter. This is one of very, very few migratory woodpeckers. Most woodpeckers stay right where they are year round. They set up their territory. They defend it, they announce it from their drumming, and they stay put year round. They establish the territory because it's got everything they need year round. Sap suckers follow the sap, and in the winter, they'll head south. And so here in Pinellas, we get a winter population of these sap suckers. The red headed woodpecker, this is one you will have to go north of Pinellas to visit. Uh, they're not uncommon further north, but like I said, mentioned before, we do not have the habitat that's suitable for red-headed woodpeckers here in Pinellas County. What we do have is plenty of trees for the red-bellied woodpecker. And this, as I mentioned, the most common with that black and white ladder back, um, redhead like me um, from, from the bridge of the nose all the way back in the males. The downy woodpecker, the smallest North American woodpecker happens to be resident right here in Pinellas County. And they are just as you would expect, very, very cute. Just little miniature woodpeckers giving it their all um, and just pecking the heck out of the tiniest of branches. Um, getting the job done, fulfilling their ecological niche and doing a really great job at it. The downy woodpeckers. So the pileated woodpecker and we have um, one of our friends and volunteers, Brian Manier, who takes awesome wildlife photographs. He happens to be an ornithologist by training, by education. Uh, you can look for his photographs on Flickr. Uh, Brian Manier, Magnier, I don't know, he's French, but doesn't say it French. M-A-G-N-I-A-R, look him up, wonderful photographs. Um, within this 
woodpecker family and within the tribe, uh, we have the pileated. And again, with that blaze of that crest of red on the crown, these are large birds. Here we have a female uh, displaying her chisel shaped beak. Uh, what she lacks is a red mustache. She does have this very striking stripe through the eye and a stripe that follows from the corner of the mouth. But in the male pileated woodpeckers, that stripe is bright red. And they don't need it to tell each other apart, but if it's important to you to know which is male and which is female, that's what you wanna be looking for, that red stripe, right, that stretches from the corner of the mouth. Now, despite the fact that woodpeckers are adapted to and perfectly capable of looking under um, and in tree branches for grubs, termites, and things like this, the pileated woodpecker has a real taste for carpenter ants. And carpenter ants are a species of ant that are capable of getting into wood. They can actually become pests where they get established. Enter the pileated woodpecker, 60%, it has been recorded, 60% of their diet is actually this species of ant, the large carpenter ants. They are the top uh, engineers in a forested ecosystem in the Southeast. Uh, these are the ones that are going to create the largest of the nest cavities for themselves. They will make a new cavity every year. They will not reuse that cavity. Something else will, quite happily. Um, it has also been observed that a cavity might be created by a pileated woodpecker and then that cavity might be rejected by the mate. So all that work, not good enough. Go make me another one. So then we now have a cavity that's been created that something else could move into. So thankfully we have these big, heavy beaked, the species that can excavate those larger holes. And this is a species that has become more adapted not by choice, um, but by necessity, as humans have moved more and more into forested areas. At first, the pileated woodpeckers retreated into undisturbed forest areas, and now there's so few of that left that the pileateds have become more adapted to living around people. And we saw a slide earlier of the pileated woodpecker that had taken advantage of a telephone pole, uh, which is basically just a dead tree, right? Uh, but hitherto they hadn't moved into or taken advantage of that kind of structure. Now we are seeing pileateds in much more suburban areas. Here we have on the left, the female, no mustache, and on the right, the male, and you can see uh, the female at the entrance to one of those nest cavities, and the male here has flicked off some of the bark, exposing what might lie beneath. Sometimes what might lie beneath could be the sap that is leaking from the tree. That, of course, would be very tasty to the woodpecker, but even more tasty would be the insects that are attracted to that sap that starts flowing after the bark is broken. The northern flicker here, again, this one is um, the one that might look the least like a woodpecker. It's not crested. It doesn't have that uh, kind of flicky red crown, uh, but it does have distinctive uh, red mustache. And in the males, a very handsome patch of black across the breast. Uh, the breast is also flecked in spots and the back is modeled in a ladder pattern of this kind of grayish brown and black. And as we saw before, that brilliant yellow coloring on the under wings. This again, a photograph in, in Julia's own backyard, a palm tree, palms having very spongy, uh, fibrous trunks, not too difficult to excavate. So some species, it might have been the flicker, 
it might have been affiliated, has created this really wonderful cavity in this palm trunk. The flicker is coming either to claim its home. Um, drama ensued. Um, cavities are at a premium. Because of human activity, we don't leave dead trees standing around. We don't like trees with holes in them at the best of times. So a hole in a tree, which is quite desirable at the best of times, are even harder to find in human developed areas. And here we have an interloper that had taken up residence. You can see his angry forehead right there. It's a starling. It's a European starling, a non-native species that was introduced into the United States for ridiculous reasons, but has become established and competes with our native birds for cavities. So and here, I'm afraid the starling won and was able to quite forcefully um, expel this flicker from this um, really desirable cavity. And so off goes the flicker, uh, leaving the um, usurper to have the cavity. The yellow-bellied sapsucker, as we mentioned earlier, this is our winter visitor. We don't have them resident. They don't nest in Pinellas County, but they do come through during the winter time. Uh, you can see they nest in Canada. They're um, high latitude species, and then they move into the Southeast US and down into Central America during the winter time. The sap suckers create sap wells, uh, which is what they're called. Very regular little excavations along the surface of smooth barked trees where they just peck in to the phloem where the sap comes out, the sugary, the, the, the sugars that are produced from photosynthesis up in the canopy. As they're being moved around uh, the body of the trees, uh, these little wells are created where that sap can leak out. And as we mentioned before with the pileated, that sap might be quite nice just to drink because it's so sugary, but it also attracts insects, nectivorous insects like bees and wasps um, and smaller insects that might actually get trapped in that sticky sap, you know, they can smell it and they can go for it, but then they land in the sap well and they're stuck. Easy pickings for the sap sucker. Red-headed woodpeckers, very, very handsome. Um, definitely live up to their name. Um, they prefer open country, which we do not have in Pinellas. We are built, we are buildings. That is the opposite of open country. They also require dead trees to create their cavities in. And as I mentioned before, in suburban areas and urban areas, we don't really have a high tolerance for dead trees. If a tree dies, somebody doesn't want to look at it, they take it away. Although that tree, we actually do a whole presentation on what happens when a tree dies um, and all the life that depends on dead trees. Here is some of that life, the red-headed woodpecker. Uh, this is one and its sister species that will make small holes in a tree at just big enough to fit an individual acorn or an individual nut into that hole. And they create this kind of cupboard. It's referred to as a larder um, of these nuts to eat later during leaner times. So let's say the acorns are all ripe and falling off the trees in October. Redheaded woodpecker makes the larder, feeds on those nuts all through the rest of the dry season and into the spring. Sadly, the redheaded woodpecker, they tend to traverse the open country that they prefer. They tend to fly pretty low. They tend to fly just because of how they've grown up, because of how they've evolved. It's just typical of the species. 
uh, in the open country where they have evolved, they, they fly about a meter off the ground. That's about it. Uh, when they're getting from one tree to another, eventually, you know, they can get high up into the trees. But when they're going from one place to the other, they, they prefer to fly about a meter off the ground right at bumper height. So there is a lot of car collisions with this species where they are found in open country. So along highways and things like that. Our most common, the red-bellied woodpecker. And again, you have to have one in your hand or you have to have a keen photographer who can capture just what is so red about the belly of this species. You have to have someone show you. So here we have the red belly of the red-bellied woodpecker, the most common in Pinellas. This one you'll find uh, in neighborhoods. Uh, you can hear them. They make a lot of racket when they're communicating with each other, with their young. I think I would, if I had to be a woodpecker, I think I would want to be a red-bellied woodpecker. They're very relaxed. Um, they tend not to make too many excavations into the trunks of trees, even though they can. They kind of prefer not to. They kind of just cruise up and down the tree trunk and they find things that are on the tree rather than in the tree. They just kind of, hmm, it's easier that way. They'll use a nest box. They'll use another species already made cavity. So they're just kind of relaxed. Um, they too can create this larder, this cupboard of nuts to survive a dry season or any other season when things, when um, their food, one of their food sources might not be readily available. So here's just a, a montage, if you will, of various photographs of our most common woodpecker. And just remember, when you see this woodpecker in Pinellas County, this is the red bellied, despite the fact that it has a mostly red head, it's not a red headed woodpecker, technically, right? Here's that one from the beginning that's particularly itchy. Um, a photograph taken by our friend Marcello. And finally, the smallest little woodpecker, the downy woodpecker, um, here with the characteristic black and white patterning of many that belong to this group of birds. Just a little bit of red on the head, uh, a shorter but still very stout beak, that zygodactylic arrangement of toes to forward to hind facing. It's doing everything that we promised at the beginning that woodpeckers do, has all the characteristics, but the downy is the smallest in North America. It's not a piculate, it's not as small as a piculate, but it's still tiny compared to our other species. Our largest being the pileated, this would be our little tiniest. Uh, you'll find this one throughout North America. It doesn't like the desert where the Gila, where the Gila woodpecker lives. You're not going to find the downy. Doesn't like the cactus, just doesn't. Does, you know, just going to leave that. Uh, very often can be found with some of our uh, migrating songbirds in the winter. It will hang out with them. Uh, some of our other songbirds, they rely on each other, especially the migrants. They can rely on each other to find food and there's enough resource during the winter for what are referred to as mixed flocks to move through the understory of a forest uh, to glean from the surface any leftover fruits, um, any currently ripening fruits, and especially any emerging or unlucky insects that might be out during the daytime when these, um, when these birds are foraging. Here, one of our migrating songbirds, the black and white warbler, these two could very easily be confused. Uh, they have very similar habits. The black and white warbler is a songbird that happens to act very much like a woodpecker. It climbs up and down trees. It doesn't necessarily fly from perch to perch like many other songbirds do. The black and white warbler loves to run up and down tree trunks. So you might see these two very close to one another. The black and white warbler just slightly smaller than the downy woodpecker, but 
you know, if you're if you're watching in the winter and you see these look very similar, but there's something that's not quite right about the two, that one looks more like a woodpecker. It's possible. It's very possible that what you're seeing is this downy woodpecker, the other being the black and white warbler. So what can you do for this group of birds? They're not teetering on the verge of extinction any more than any other um, any of our animal species that are suffering at the hands of habitat destruction. What can you do to help? Help prevent habitat destruction. Um, there are many ways to do that. And we're certainly not here to identify individual projects, but that could be up to you. Take care of the habitat that you have. Uh, maintain whatever habitat you have the sphere of influence over and make it friendly for not just woodpeckers, but all wildlife. As we mentioned earlier, a dead tree supports an awful lot of life. Everything from bacteria and fungus and algae and, you know, liverwort, very, very basic life forms, all the way up to nesting vertebrates and raccoons, snakes, armadillos, everybody. Everybody loves a dead tree. So if you have a dead tree in your sphere of influence that you have provision over, consider leaving it be and letting it give back and exist for the habitat that it creates as that dead tree. As long as it's not posing any threat to you, your family, your neighbors, or the public at large, let the tree decompose in place. Tolerating a certain amount of what are referred to as pests in the garden. Uh, caterpillars that might be eating your ornamentals, caterpillars that might be eating your vegetables, let them have some, share, tolerate a certain pest load. Don't go and eliminate all the caterpillars with some kind of spray or spray for every single thing. Uh, number one, you might be accidentally poisoning something further along the food chain. Uh, and number two, you're actually providing uh, a food source. Let the birds in particular, the woodpeckers come in and take those caterpillars away from you. Consider putting up a nest box. Remember, this, uh, this our red-bellied woodpecker will move in to a nest box. Uh, be that engineer, create that cavity for cavity nesters. And we have a link uh, that'll go in the chat uh, where you can uh, read up more on how to construct a nest box for different kinds of species. Different species need different opening sizes and depths and they need to be made out of different materials and placed at different heights. Uh, but you, in the absence of say a pileated woodpecker, you can take over that uh, role as the ecological engineer and pass the information along. Um, let someone know that that drumming sound on the gutter or on that hollow piece of metal, that's only for a brief period of time. And there's a reason for it. It's not a deranged woodpecker that's going to do that forever, all day and night long. It's only to announce a territory, to establish a territory, and to advertise for mates. Once the marriage ceremony is over, the drumming should stop. Uh, just pay this information forward, educating others, um, empower others to look after their uh, bit of habitat. And of course, as extension, uh, we suggest and prefer that in educating others, you do this in a, a caring way. Um, no one reacts well to having their having a finger shoved in their face. You're doing it the wrong way. You should stop doing that. You're a bad person. That's not how you get a response. Just show people how wonderful this group of birds is, how fascinating they are, how much they contribute to the overall health. Uh, these are the kinds of things that make people want to care. So pass this forward, if you will. We'll get to questions. Now's the time to grab a drink of water. Uh, take a quick break, if you'd like. Uh, we're going to have people add some questions into the, the Q&A. 
uh, and we'll get to those questions after a quick poll. We're going to ask about um, just a few things. Uh, how did how did you rate the quality uh, and your knowledge about the subject before and after? Uh, we love this data. Uh, we mine this data, but we do not mine your personal data. So this is a completely anonymous poll. If you wouldn't mind just filling this out, uh, as soon as we have about 70 or 80 percent of this poll, you can just tick one of the boxes and, and make sure to scroll down and then submit. And once about 70 or 80 percent of y'all have filled it in, we'll close that and we'll get on to questions. All right, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julia, for posting that poll for us and for running everything behind the scenes. Um, as always, doing such a fantastic job with managing all of our behind the scenes uh, as we present our, our educational programming. It's always Julia that's uh, making this move forward. So of course, thanks again for that. Uh, we have a question, a very good question. Are kookaburras related to woodpeckers? Can you all picture a kookaburra? They look very much like a woodpecker. And the answer to that is yes, kind of. There is that familial resemblance, um, but kookaburra are more closely related to kingfishers. And kingfishers as a group can be treated just like woodpeckers as a group. So within the group of kingfishers, we have, within that group, we have the kookaburras, but the kingfishers and the woodpeckers are very closely related, but they do make separate groups. Does that make sense? So we've got the woodpecker group, we've got the kingfisher group. Within the kingfisher group, we have the kookaburras, but the kingfishers and the woodpeckers are very close to one another. So great question. And... Susan would like to know, I had a dead pine tree in my yard for a long time, but I had to take it down when it started leaning towards your house, of course. Um, what's the easiest thing to do to attract woodpeckers? Again, um, a, a tolerance of pest, uh, a you know, don't do a lot of pest control in the yard. Um, that provides a food source. The caterpillars, the things that munch on the leaves of anything, um, that becomes your best bird feeder. Uh, during the dry season, which runs from, you know, November to May, during the dry season, uh, you can actually put out bird feeders. There are certain woodpecker species that are attracted to bird feeders. And in the bird feeders, there are certain species that quite like the, um, the raw shelled peanuts, very high uh, nutrient dense, very oily, very fatty. Woodpeckers are also known to favor uh, suet, S-U-E-T. It's a byproduct um, of the animal food industry. It's actually fat. It's rendered animal fat, often with uh, bird seed mixed into it. Again, very nutrient dense, uh, can be very valuable food source during the dry season here in this part of Florida. But if you do choose to go down the route of, of feeding uh, birds, please make sure that you do it in a very clean, very sanitary, um, way, check the feeders every day, clean the feeders regularly. Um, feeding birds can cause unnatural concentrations 
of mixtures of species in close proximity to one another, providing excellent avenues for disease contagion. So it's very important if you do choose to be feed birds, get a sanitation grade A, okay? Don't just throw the seeds out there. We got to thank you, so you're very welcome. Our pleasure. Uh, where do you place a nest box is an excellent question from Anne. And it really depends on the type of nest box, the type of species that you're looking to attract to that nest box. Different birds are gonna look in different places for their cavities. So, <coughs> excuse me. If you do peruse the fact sheet on helping cavity nesters in Florida, there's actually a chart that uh, shows you how high up into the canopy onto the side of a tree, you would want to place that box for the particular species. Um, for instance, wood ducks, they have to be a particular distance above the surface of the water. I know that screech owl boxes need to be at least 15 feet up the side of a tree, ideally, um, which isn't always an easy thing. So have a look at the fact sheet, see if that helps. Um, make sure the, the target species is actually found in your area. A bluebird box in downtown Clearwater probably wouldn't bring much joy. We just don't have the bluebirds in downtown Clearwater. Uh, the best and worst food for woodpeckers. I hope I kind of uh, address that. Uh, they are known to favor the shelled peanuts and the suet, although they'll certainly take whatever you got. Um, you will find woodpeckers um, feeding on just about anything, but those two foods in particular seem to be favored. Um, uh, are there any hairy woodpeckers in the Pinellas area? Not currently. Uh, I won't say that the hairy woodpecker has never been recorded in Pinellas County, but they're not resident here. Um, how far can you hear woodpeckers? Well, a good woodpecker, you could hear, um, I believe it's two, their sound can carry for two miles. So that is a loud woodpecker. So where can you see a red cockaded woodpecker? You would have to go to one of the management areas. Red cockaded woodpeckers are not they are not adapted to human disturbance. They are not as flexible in their lifestyle as the other species that have adapted to human encroachment into wild areas. The red cockaded woodpecker sadly is not as flexible, is not as adaptable and has retained as a species the need for a very large, very large, very dead or alive. Anyway, it doesn't matter, but very, very large pine trees, which we took away all of in Florida. As Soon as we got to Florida, we see these giant trees, they're all ours, we're gonna take them down. Unfortunately, the red cockaded woodpeckers need those giant trees to nest in. So you would have to, if you want to see a red cockaded woodpecker, you would have to go to, one of the wildlife management areas that is actually open to the public. A lot of uh, a lot of red cockaded woodpecker habitat is on private land, and you're not allowed to go there. So if you um, you would have to look towards uh, north of here and towards the center of the state for some of these uh, management areas uh, where you might just see a red cockaded woodpecker. Oh no, we have a downy woodpecker that likes the suet feeder. So we have um, some testimony that the suet feeder has worked for the little downy, uh, but unfortunately the woodpecker also likes to peck holes in the wooden house. What are some suggestions? Um, I did not, I have never internalized any management facts about, um, I've never, learned how to repel wildlife. It's just something I've never done. It's not that it's not written about, it's not that it's not researched, but I haven't got that answer. I do know that if you go to 
the University of Florida, IFAS, the IFAS extension. Um, there are fact sheets, especially for what to do about nuisance wildlife. And I believe they do address the fact that some species of woodpecker might be attracted to wooden shingles, uh, both on siding and some houses actually have wooden shingles for roofing. So sadly, I can't answer your question live, but hopefully you can find that answer through IFAS, uh, through the EDIS. Um, hopefully we can send you a link to that. Would I consider doing a webinar on kookaburras? That'd be fun, but sadly, I really don't know much more about kookaburras than what I've already said. Um, they're fun, it's fun to say, kookaburra, right? I love to go and visit the kookaburras over at um, Bush Gardens, but I don't think I have enough information about the kookaburras to wrap up into a, uh, an entire hour. Be one to look for though. Excellent question with the kookaburras. Um, how high do woodpeckers live up in trees? Well, considering here in Pinellas County, our trees don't really get that tall, our species will go to the tops of the trees that we have. And our trees are, they probably max out at, you know, 80 feet, not very big at all. But in forests with higher canopies, the woodpeckers that are distributed there are going to take advantage of that entire tree canopy. Um, the, do woodpeckers migrate? Sometimes of the year they seem to be absent at the feeders, the downy for assistance. Uh, most woodpeckers do not migrate. Most woodpeckers, not just in Pinellas County, but worldwide, they tend to establish a home territory and they stay there. Uh, the exception in our area is the uh, sapsucker. The sapsucker will migrate nesting in Canada and following the sap because the sap doesn't flow in Canada in the winter and they depend on that. So they move down to the south where trees are still moving photosynthate through their, through their plumbing system most other woodpeckers stay put. As far as not seeing certain species at your feeders at various times of year, that has a lot to do with the fact that many bird species vary their diet throughout the year. And when a certain highly nutritious food source is very available, let's say caterpillars or insects, have an emergence in the spring, you know, all the insects are coming out of their winter cocoons or they're hatching out for the first time for the spring to take advantage of that nice soft plant growth. That's what these species are going to focus on and the, the woodpeckers are no exception. Uh, they'll give up on seeds, which take a lot more to eat than they actually get out of uh, in favor of the insects when they're available. So the fact that you don't see them at their feeders doesn't mean that they're not around. They're just eating something else, um, usually at nesting time, because it takes an awful lot of caterpillars to get a baby woodpecker from egg to fledge uh, in just a few weeks time. Excellent questions. We've gone on oh, about 13. Oops, have we got to all the, oh, uh, here we have someone from Broward County. Um, you've seen the red-bellied woodpeckers put up a nest box, suet. There is a no-melt suet. We're getting this information from Mary Lou. Very good. Um, because suet is that beef fat, uh, has can get melty and rancid in the hot and humid Florida. Sounds like from a seasoned bird feeder, Mary Lou, that there is suet that is made and formulated for our hot, humid client. Um, I don't see any harm in putting up a nest box ever, um, because again, tree cavities are at a premium in our built up areas because we don't have the tolerance for trees with holes in them. So, you know, you can put up this nest box with the cavity um, that is somehow more aesthetically pleasing to the general public than a dead tree with holes in it. Uh, 
the risk of putting up any nest box ever is that you might get residents that you hadn't anticipated. And I'm not going to lie and or brush over the fact that honeybees love a cavity. And there have been many stories of nest boxes being overtaken by a hive of honeybees. It makes perfect sense. It's clean, it's dry, it's protected, it's sheltered. It's, it's all the things that you would want if you were um, a queen bee looking for a nice safe place to live. So your nest box might become a beehive and it might be that for be that for a few years. Then of course you'd have to take it down and clean it out and try again. So I would never hesitate to put up a nest box, give back to the uh, habitat, give back to the environment with the caveat that you might not get the cute birds. You might get the mean old paper wasps. It could happen, but it's all part of the bigger picture. Hope that, hope that helps. My Rita has a friend in Tennessee that lives in a log home and a woodpecker is creating severe damage excavating the carpenter bee lar larva. Man, they really have provided some habitat, not only for the woodpeckers, but for the carpenter bees. Uh, dissuade them from picking on his home. He lives in 30 acres. Of Missouri. Yes, and again, I'm afraid I don't have in my in my mouth today the answer. Um, I don't own the answers um, for repelling in wildlife, although that research has been done, it exists. I hope that you can, um, through reaching out, um, looking up nuisance wildlife woodpeckers, nuisance wildlife woodpeckers um, through your local, be it Pinellas County Extension, University of Florida Extension writ large, or any of the extension offices. There is certainly uh, a good handful of extension offices throughout Tennessee um, that might have great answers for that. Um, and another, is Hillsboro pretty much the same as Pinellas with regards to Woodpecker? I believe so. I think there are areas in, in Hillsboro County where you can see the red-headed Woodpecker. If you went to Chinsegut, C-H-I-N-S-E-G-U-T, Chinsegut. That I think is in Hillsborough County. If it's not, it's near as damn it. Um, Chinsegut is a good place to go and see the red-headed woodpeckers. Okay, thank you so much for your questions. As always, we depend on your questions. We depend on your um, uh, suggestions, all these things, they always help everyone get the answers that they want and get the most out of our presentations. We hope that you would uh, look back at some of our previous presentations uh, at our YouTube channel uh, where you can watch at your leisure. Uh, we will have either this very presentation recorded and put out there or you will find a recording of uh, this same presentation that has been done previous uh, by navigating to our YouTube channel. Also many other topics to explore there. Um, fascinating subjects. Uh, one of my favorites, the 500 million years of Brooker Creek. So what has happened right on our spot over the past uh, 500 million years? That's available from our YouTube channel. If you didn't find us through Facebook, uh, we do uh, again, it's Julia that drives our, our social presence on Facebook. Lots of information is delivered, uh, lots of upcoming programs, presentations, a lot of the activities that happen at Brooker Creek, a lot of educational information as well, is distributed through our Facebook, which is the Brooker Creek Environmental Education Center. If you have anything that you need to tell me directly, please don't hesitate. Uh, it's my job. You can reach me first initial, last name, Jay Stevenson, and then at PinellasCounty.org. Thanks for joining us for Woodpeckers 101. I hope you picked up a few um, salient tidbits about this interesting group of birds. We'll say goodbye and another thank you. Hope you'll join us. Uh, our next presentation will be back to plants. We'll talk about some ferns, some of our native ferns fascinating ancient group of plants here in Pinellas. 
Uh, and two weeks later, we'll talk about some epiphytes. Uh, our epiphytic orchids are flowering right now at Brooker Creek Preserve. Come walk the boardwalks, uh, take in some views, see our epiphytes, and then come and hear me shout to you about them on the 21st. Hope to see you then. Thanks a lot and have a great afternoon.